So, we're continuing our lessons in the book of James, so if you want to open up your Bibles and go to James chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, 5, James 5. So we, this is kind of a bridge point. I mean, he, last week we looked at the idea of the warning to the rich at the beginning of chapter 5. And it's kind of a stern warning in the way that he starts out just in verse 1 in talking about you rich, weep, and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And the, the riches that you have rot, you know, they rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have, are cor have corroded, and their corrosions will be evidence against you. And he goes on through there, and it kind of sounds, wow, wow, what, what's it with this with the rich? You know, what's he picking on them? Now remember, you know, this is James talking to Christians. He's talking to those that probably are different social classes. And so there's, you know, there, I don't know if he has some insight because of the Holy Spirit, and maybe there are some that are feeling extremely comfortable with their wealth and their positions. And just like any type of society, you have people. And I'm sure that it's no different with churches, you know, and some of the people. And these are new Christians, so this is new churches and such that they're dealing with. But he, he, he then, as we come to this topic tonight, um, at the last, in verse 6, he says there, he says, You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And what he's referring to is the corruption in their business dealings. Apparently, they were withholding some of their pay or not paying a fair labor, a uh, fair wage. And, you know, maybe just the way they were treating people. And we see that today with employers, it, not as much as we would see if it was in the 1800s in America. Even in the, in the 1920s and 30s, we didn't really see a lot of labor laws come in to protect workers. And so, you know, the big industries, as we were becoming during the uh, Industrial Revolution, and factories were growing up in our country, there was a lot of horrible working environments. And workers, in the, in the bosses didn't care. Employers, owners of these factories, they didn't care. You wanted to put your 10-year-old in there, slave laboring, they didn't care. Was there asbestos and dangerous product everywhere? They didn't care. All they cared about was really getting, getting their money, making their, their, their wealth. And so it's interesting how our country started to really try to minimize this, this ability of people who have against those who have not. And, and yet we see here James is really expressing that as well. But it doesn't stop at all, does it? I mean, it doesn't stop all of the injustices of people who have power over others. And even today, there's ways that it gets around it. Um, contracts can be manipulated, um, different ways that people work with others or promises that are made can still have some corruption in them and most of us we're on the bottom end of that <laughs> we're not the ones looking down and saying well i have these employees under me most of us are the ones that are having to deal with are we getting the hours that we had worked are they cutting my hours back you know are they making everybody a part-timer so that they get no benefits Right? That's something that's happened. There's a lot of corporations that, instead of having to pay health care, you know, they decided, we'll just go part-time. We'll just turn all of our jobs part-time, and therefore, we don't have to give, according to the law, the law says, we don't have to give you know, health care benefits to those who are working part-time. And then people are having to work more hours at the same company because they can only work so many hours to keep part-time but then they work around it and still can work you and you get your hour. And it's manipulation, isn't it? It's bottom line, it's a manipulation. And it's not fair. So there is a, a, a level of indecency about the way that uh, people look at those that are working for them, the power that we exert upon others around us. But as, we, as he moves in this letter to the next point of looking at the idea of patience, he links it because the very first verse, he then says, be patient, therefore. Other translations say, then be patient. So I think he's linking, linking together the idea of what we're suffering through. 
some commentators, you know, they say that this is about patience and suffering. And I, and I read through there, and the only way that you can grab that is by that one key word, you know, in verse 7. It says, in the, I'm reading the ESV, it says, therefore, and then others say, then. And so if you read that, it would say, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient then. See how that would work? Be patient, therefore. Therefore, meaning because of these things. If you're on the other side of this, it's suffering, then be patient. So, you know, that's not an attribute that we're good at. But yet it's interesting to me that it's a part of everything we do is about waiting, isn't it? So let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll come back, and I've got some application. So starting in verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering, and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and have heard, have seen the purpose of the Lord and how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers, uh, let's stop there. So, there's something in this that, now it came out to me, and I don't know, but the way he uses this coming of the Lord. If you look at this, there's three times he, he mentions this idea of coming of the Lord in verse 1, and then he says it in 8, you know, establishing your hearts, the coming of the Lord, and then he says in 9, he says, the judge is standing at the door. Who's that? That's the Lord. And we go and look in other passages. There seems to be this message from the apostles in their letters. It seems as if the coming of the Lord is any moment that is fixing to happen. And I want to address that because it, it is confusing. It does seem like, well, if, if they're exhorting them that the Lord is fixing to come real soon, and we are now living over 2,000 years later, what happened? So only a couple of things could have happened. Either he was wrong, or we don't understand what it means by the Lord coming, or he's come. Right? I mean, those are the only three things you can say. He was wrong, which I think we can get rid of that one. We don't understand what he means. Okay, maybe that one. I think most of us fall into that. We don't really know what he means. Or the third one is that he came. Or it has a whole other meaning. And I think that when it says, you know, he's already came, well, so what would that mean to the reader? So it could mean a couple of things when you talk about the coming of the Lord and this judge is at the hand. It's soon. It does show a sense of soon in time. This is before the destruction of Jerusalem. James is writing this from Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of people who would probably have just as much, I've seen it and read it, you know, that would say, mm, that's not necessarily that, that somehow that he was going to come back. Some have said, well, he was going to come back and establish a kingdom. Well, that again would say, well, then where is it if it was that physical kingdom that the Jews say that he's going to come establish? So we have to come back then again. What recent kind of an event or that would come soon, that would be mean the coming of the Lord. Now, the old prophets, we'll see, we see in the language there that language that was used prophetically would indicate the coming of the Lord as a judgment. That he wasn't going to show up and say, hey, I'm over here, I, I got here. Or, as you know, I kind of always thought, the Lord came once, didn't he? He came in the form of a baby, and he grew up, and there's the Lord. The, come, the Lord came. 
Now, a lot were thinking that it was a physical reappearance of him. But if you, we, we, again, we've got to look back at who is the originator, originator of this message. It goes back to God the Father. So now we have to think about how does God the Father... Now, I'm using common sense here, so in, my common sense doesn't always mean it's perfect. <laughs> but I kind of look at the bigger picture and think, okay, so if this is God the Father speaking, and he's saying the Lord is coming soon... And the judge is at the door. And Peter also says that, that it's coming soon. Paul even says it in Corinthians as if it's coming soon. And all of these were written to Christians. So, you know, even though James is writing this letter in Jerusalem, and it could mean, if he's writing it to them and the letter just stayed in Jerusalem, hey guys, the Roman army's fixing to come. And historically, we know it, they did. They came in 70 AD and totally destroyed it. In Matthew 24, and over in Luke as well, Jesus talks about that some of you are going to live and see this day come when the temple is overthrown and everything is destroyed. In Luke, he gets more specific and he says, when you see the army of abomination surround the city, when you see it coming in, that was, he was being literal. That's exactly what the emperor Nero ordered uh, uh, the, the uh, generals to do was to come in. They landed in Egypt, Alexandria, and they came in in Caesarea and landed there. And they came in with the legions and came up. Well, then in the middle of all of this, while they're trying to put down this rebellion and they're proceeding towards Jerusalem, Nero kills himself. And the legions stopped. And they withdrew. Aspasia was one of the generals he pulled back. His son Titus was serving with him as a general of half the legions, and Aspasia went back to Alexandria in Egypt. And that's the year they call of four emperors. There was all this disturbance, and one would come up and say, I'm now the Caesar. He got murdered. Another one comes up, and he got murdered. And, and Aspasia was sitting down in Alexandria, and he's waiting, and then all of a sudden, all the legions said, you know what? We want you to be the emperor. So he moves up towards, and he sends Titus, his son, who is also, so guess what's happening in Judea? The Roman army and the legions are encampments. So Aspasia goes up, goes to Rome, conquer, takes over, starts serving, and guess what he does? Titus started up, fired up. And so Titus, who becomes an emperor later, he takes the armies and proceeds. And you talk about slash and burn you know, General Sherman going through Atlanta had nothing on Titus. <laughs> Titus was annihilating. They said you could tell the path of the army by the bodies floating down the Jordan. That's how they knew where the army was. That's, I mean, they were slaughtering children, women, burning everything. And as the legions came around Jerusalem, they besieged it, and in 70 AD, destroyed it and raised it down to the ground, every stone. Just exactly what he was talking about. Matthew 24, and also over in Luke. So that's a historical event that you will find that all the letters are dated around. Whenever scholars try to date events and things, they'll say, well, we know these historical events occurred because they're recorded outside of the Bible. And that's one that was definitely <laughs> recorded outside the Bible. So that's why they will use that as kind of one of those anchor dates, historical events. So that's why when we look at this, we have to kind of think, okay, so he's saying, coming to the Lord. The Lord said, you will see me. Remember when the, the priest went crazy? He said, you will see me coming and descending with the clouds. They knew exactly what he meant. Because that's the same phrases and the use of language that God said he was going to do to Egypt. Same words. So they understood that he was talking about coming back and destroying and bringing punishment upon them. So whether you are in Jerusalem or anywhere in the Judea region, even as far as the churches in Asia Minor, this disruption was going to be more than just localized. So I, my humble thought, is that he's talking about this event. That it was going to impact, because now, who were those Christians? Whether they were locally, or they were off living in 
Ephesus, or no matter where they're at, they were Jewish. And those who were well-to-do and had family connections back, remember where was the Jews' heritage come from? It came from their personal family wealth. So it goes back to Jerusalem. It goes back to Judea. So whether your family lived in Jerusalem or it lived in Bethlehem, no matter where they lived, every Jewish family, no matter where you lived, was going to suffer a tremendous loss because all that family connection was where your wealth lied, was in that family. So I, th I think James is giving a warning here because there was a lot of Christians, no matter where they were living, had a lot of wealth and power and connections still established, even under the rule of the Romans, with their family connections through the Judean region. But once this event occurred, the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem, and the devastating destruction that the Romans brought upon that whole area, it was going to hurt them all. And it was a reminder that James was trying to tell them and say, wake up, what is your priority? You know, your money, your gold, all that, you need to weep and howl because, you know, that's going to go away. And trying to get Christians to refocus that the physical things in this world are not what's important. What's important is your life before God and others around you. And so then he comes and gives a cons consolation to those who really don't have anything that may be suffering as well from other problems in their lives. So there's three things, three points that I want to bring that I think are truths that we can think about when it comes to patience. Is the first thing is waiting. The idea here is waiting. Um, and it's commanded. He says, be patient. Because when you say be patient, it automatically tells you, wait. There's a delay. Patient. When we look at that, he says, be patient, therefore, until this occurs. Because when this occurs, wait. You know, we really don't like waiting at all. You know, you ever heard the phrase, wait for it, wait for it? You know, Snapchat. Snapchat, they put out all these videos, and they're on Facebook. And now that when I'm on there, you'll see you have a place where you can go watch all these little cute videos. And, and the whole premise of those are they'll start out, and they'll have some little skit or something going on. And, and, and a lot of times, I don't have the patience, so I go past it. And then I, all of a sudden, someday I'll click on it and go ahead and watch the whole thing. And it's like, I didn't wait for it. You ever had that? You wait, wait for it. Wait for it. It's coming. And you're like, eh, and you're done something like that? You never waited for it? Or somebody tells you, it's a really good movie. You ought to watch it. And then they watch it, and they're sitting there, and, uh, 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 and, then, and then you just you know, lose interest. They didn't wait for it. There's a part of that with us. There, so implied in this is the command of you, you have to wait, you have to delay, and this idea that we don't like that. There's just something that we're so against it. And the irony is, our life is filled with waiting. Think about it. You have to wait for your birthday. You have to wait to file your taxes. You have to wait till your taxes come back. You have to wait in traffic. You have to wait at a stoplight. You, you, everything. You, we wait. Now think about the farmer that he just used. What happens while you're waiting? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And it's kind of like, no. See, that's where he uses the farmer that is so beautiful. It's not just that casual application here. Because the farmer, he has to wait. Now, the reference that he uses here actually comes from Deuteronomy 11 when God tells him through the Mosaic Law, the people, he says, if you love me and you follow after me, you will receive the early rains and the late rains. Now, they didn't have irrigation, <laughs> like out here in the Southwest. That's all we know. People back in the Midwest, they understand. They get theirs from the sky, from the rain. And so you depend upon those cycles. And in between them, what do you do? You wait. And you wait. Is nothing happening? No, there's a lot going on, isn't there? 
A lot of things that are beyond your control. If that plant and that seed germates, starts to grow and get more mature, what can you do? You can add fertilizer. We can. But it still doesn't produce it instantly. You still have to wait. And so there's this idea that we, we just, we, we know that waiting is a part of our life. But yet, we seem to be miserable with it. And so that's the problem when we say about having patience. We seem to have no patience, but yet we live in a world that demands it, that needs it. And the beauty is that in the waiting, there's a lot of beautiful things that are happening. You know, God could have created, honestly, I mean, he's God. He could have created everything in a blink of an eye. But he did it in six days. And he waited. Think about it. When the sun went down, he waited until the sun came back up. And then he created. And then he waited. Now, I don't know exactly all that's going on there. Maybe there's more. But to me, I always thought about when it comes to waiting, why did he wait for a day? And he could have created everything in one instant and said, there it is, and then named seven days. And you notice that he even gave us, he said, the stars and everything to mark our seasons so that we would know and be able to mark time. And so our life around the year is around waiting for these different seasons to come past and and revolve. He gave us a seven-day week. And I was listening to one of these apologetics, one of the videos that I was watching, and he said, it's not insignificant that there's seven days and that we need to be able to mark time and know as time is going on. And he said that what's also interesting is that seven days is the same amount that every culture around the world uses. And it's not just recent because we're all on the Internet and interconnected, but it's always been that. God has designed everything in our life around this idea of waiting. Look how long it took for him to bring forward the Messiah. 2,000 years. 2,000 years. It's like he could have done it with, you know, right after the flood, after Noah got off the boat and said, well, you know, it's not going to get any better. I mean, God knew it wasn't, that people were still going to be sinning. So what's the big deal? Why wait another 1,500 years before you finally bring him? Abraham, think about him, right? I mean, he had to sit there and wait. It was like he was over 80, nearly 100 years old. By the time he finally has a kid, he had to wait. Look at Noah. He worked on that boat and preached for over 100 years. Look at all that waiting. If he wanted to, God could have given him a boat and said, Shut the doors, it's fixing to happen. Look how long it rained. All the time that he was on that boat, waiting, waiting. There's something very necessary for us to understand that. And so, the other part of this, it's kind of like a bookend. The way that James is doing this. He began the book, he began this book with talking about patience and enduring suffering and trials. And he there mentions about the idea of helping to understand and act wisely while you're what? Wading through it. Praying to the Lord to have wisdom, to be able to make the right decisions while you are waiting. Just like a tree or any type of a fruit, we can look at it, we know that you have to wait to the right time in order for it to be just perfect. Some plants, you might be able to pick a tomato a little early while it's green and let it ripen. But most of them, you still have to wait for just the right time. Even cattle, harvesting, livestock, everything. There's that waiting and patience. And I think it's because of who we are and the way we are. It's understanding that everything that we desire is not necessarily good to have it immediate. But again, that's against our society, isn't it? We want it now. We have the ability to have it instant. Who hasn't ordered something on Amazon Prime and wanted it here in two days shipping? 
And then when it didn't show up, hmm, I ordered a part. It wasn't supposed to come in until next Tuesday. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to finish working on that until it comes in. It came in yesterday. Oh, and I was like, or Friday, I think it came in Friday. And I was like, so blown away. It, it was in, it, so it's, it just reminded me of how much we want things now. And it's taken me a long time, even in my older age, to finally settle into being satisfied with waiting. The Lord waits on us, doesn't he? So waiting is something that he wants us to understand. And he has, unfortunately, has to command us. Be patient. And that's why I say that it's something that's very common. It's every aspect of our life and why James uses the illustration of the farmer. There's not an impatient farmer that's successful. It's not going to be. They get out of the business. A lot of people can't do farming just because of that. And they depend on it. Isaiah says something about the way that the Lord, and he says in Isaiah 64, 6, about the idea of not seeing the process and seeing God, but yet he is there. And that's what I thought was so beautiful. He says in 64.4, he says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of you, of those who wait for him. Doesn't that, doesn't that describe us? Has anybody heard him? Anyone seen him standing there with you? But that's what I thought when I saw that, that passage. I thought, you know, that's what we forget so much about is the idea that God is with us. And he says, from the beginning of time, that is the way it's been to wait on the Lord. Peter, in 2 Peter, talks about it as well. And he says in 2 Peter 3, 11, or 2 Peter 3, 11 and 13, he says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, talking about the judgment of the earth and the final, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because which, of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his power, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So don't we wait on heaven? We should. If you're so eager, like we should be, and yearning to be with God and to receive that final reward, look at the suffering that people go through, and you just wonder, how long, O oh Lord, you cry out, it's like the martyrs that you read about in Revelation that are crying out to God in heaven. Oh, Lord, how long, how long? So, you know, the idea of waiting is something that is, is needful for us to see and to receive it. The third thing is courageous. It, it takes courage to be able to wait and be patient. And that, that's what's so difficult at times is we, we have this logic, we have this knowledge and these words that we know, but then when it comes to putting them into action and feeling comfortable with them, it's a little frightening, a little unsettling to us at times. And so the psalmist, I think, expresses this concern, you know, and this idea of waiting when he says in Psalms 27, 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Courage to me is the ability to act under fear. When we talk about somebody, we think of courage as like people in combat, the Medal of Honor recipients. When we look at them and we see that them, that, that during some of the most fearful moments that these men and their lives are just second by second as it's happening, as this event is unfolding, that instead of cowering down and trying to protect themselves, they have the courage with the fear, they control that fear, and they're able to move forward and take action. And I love going through and looking at and reading that. I, I got to go to the Medal of Honor recipients annual convention 
back in 89. And I listened to those stories, and I got to meet some of those men, and I'm telling you, them, that is courage. It, but you ask them, they are so humble. They'll say, no, I was scared to death. And one of them told me, you know what courage is? Courage is the ability to act when you're scared to death, and you still are functional. That's what God was telling Joshua when Joshua was getting ready to take over for Moses. Can you imagine filling Moses' shoes? I mean, look what Moses had done. And now Moses is gone, and Joshua comes up, and he's got to take over. And not only just take over and manage things, he's got to take over and take them across the Jordan and conquer this whole land. And that's why in Joshua 1, God repeatedly tells him, Be strong and courageous. When you're fearful, keep moving. Keep acting. And that's what we need. And that's what patience helps us to do. It helps us to develop the ability to endure. The ability to have that courage and know with confidence that we can function no matter what is scaring us to death. Whether it's the overwhelming financial problems that we may be facing, the overwhelming problems of our families, death, health, no matter what we're facing, we have courage to be able to continue to function the way God wants us to function. I'm telling you, we need more courage. We need more courageous Christians. And even today, when it comes to the attack on our faith and our moral values, we need Christians to be patient and courageous during those struggles. And the psalmist says in Psalms 40, verse 1 through 4, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction and out of the mire bog. And he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie, after a delusion. Look at, look at that. You know, look at what he's saying, some of the things he brings out. One, he cried to the Lord. So there's no shame during these times that we're waiting to pour out our hearts, to cry to God. And what did God respond to? He heard him, and he delivered him. Remember what the other psalm said? Who has ever seen him actually there beside us? From the ancient times, we've never seen him, heard him, or perceived him, but we know he is there. I think this is what James as well is trying to get across to the people who are listening and reading this letter. And then he goes on to say, he secured my steps. And look at this. In the middle of all of that trouble, the psalmist here says, he put a song, a new song in my heart. And I don't think it was a funeral song. I think it was a song to uplift, to encourage. And that's what the Lord will do for us as we look at that. To kind of wrap this over into To Paul, he says something that I think is also very important and really kind of relates to this idea of harvesting and getting what we will, we will reap what we sow and the great reward that's waiting in in Galatians 6 verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That's the lesson. Were you patient enough to wait for it? (laughs) Because that's what, that's all it is. It's what we need to be able to do is to wait on the Lord. Not wait on our own abilities. Not wait on some person coming along and providing something for us. Having the courage to be able to continue to serve God in face of all the fears that are coming at us. And you know what's going to happen is people are going to see us when that's happening to us. And I guarantee you, people want to come to those who are courageous, not the cowards. 
And that's how we bring people to God. So if you're with us this evening and there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with him, I hope that you'll take this moment to reflect how you've been living with your father and how you can serve him better, how you can establish a relationship if you haven't. Think about it. It's a very simple plan. Repent and be baptized and your sins will be forgiven, as Paul said, I mean, Peter said in Acts. If you're a Christian and you have sinned, then I pray that you will take a moment, turn to the Father, be honest, decide to change what you're doing, and continue to have the courage to serve the way he wants. The reward is great, but patience is required. So think about these things while we stand and sing.